Well, go ahead and preach the word of God to us. Okay. okay. Uh, if you have a Bible, go to Galatians chapter 1. Galatians chapter 1. Galatians chapter 1. We won't be in Galatians very long, but we are introducing our subject from our Galatians 1. So Galatians 1. Um, well, I guess establishing context will get started on verse 1. It says, Paul, an apostle, not of men, neither by man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead, and all the brethren which are with me unto the churches of Galatia. Okay, grace to you, be to you, and peace from God the Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ who gave himself for our sins, that he might deliver us from this present evil world, according to the will of God and our Father. To whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, okay, a different one, which is not another, uh, meaning another of the same kind of the one that they had originally received, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we are an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. And, or excuse me, as we said before, so I say now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be accursed. Okay, for do I now persuade men or God? Or do I seek to please men for if I yet pleased men, I should not be the servant of Christ. Okay, so we're going to focus our attention on verse 10. But to establish the context um, of verse 10, and there's actually a greater context if you were to go further, we're going to be preaching through Galatians. But as far as I want to, he brought up a subject kind of in passing, is the fact that he seeks to please God and not man. And it's in the context here in particular that he's writing to them that the churches at, in the region of Galatia, which would have been north, uh, north, central, north, kind of almost northwest, north central, centralish, going eastward in what would be modern day Turkey, um, they were being infected with a teaching, uh, in particular by Judaizers. Okay, which we're, we see throughout most in the New Testament uh, and in others, Paul's writings, that they would teach that you would have to be a keeper of the law in order to be saved or in order to, 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 be, to be pleasing to God. Um, that Jesus Christ and the salvation that he gives wasn't sufficient for your, uh, not, not just your spiritual maturity, but even just your spiritual standing before God. So in other words, you had to do something else. And he writes to them, and he says in particular that he's, he marvels that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ. And the grace of Christ is that he's done everything necessary for you to be pleasing to God. And the reason why is because uh, by the, he's going to say later on in this book in particular, he says, by the uh, deeds of the law shall no flesh be justified. So in other words, it's not possible for a human to be able to be pleasing to God through fleshly works, even keeping God's law. Because the thing is, it's the law he writes to them in particular was as a schoolmaster to bring people to the attention and awareness of their need for Christ so that they would turn to Christ. Uh, it was never intended as a means to be able to receive grace from God or to win favor from God. Uh, you kept it in faith, believing, because that's what would be well-pleasing to God, but the fact is it's not what gains you favor or gains you access to heaven or gets you eternal life. It's Christ himself that gives you eternal life because he's the payment for our sin. So that was the actual good news. The good news, which is gospel, was Christ is your, as, uh, as, as it's put in First John, he's a propitiation for our sins and not for our sins only, but for the sins of the whole world. So he writes to them and then he brings up this argument here, just kind of in passing is, 
in verse 10, do I now persuade men or God, or do I seek to please men? Okay, it's kind of a rhetorical question. No, he's not seeking to please men. And he says here, for if I yet please men, I should not be the servant of Christ. So he puts as kind of a dichotomy here that if we're going to be pleasing to God, then we got to obviously, in faith, we got to believe Him and then be obedient and yield ourselves to Him. In particular here, it's going to be regarding the argument that he's putting forth was the, the proclamation of the gospel and the living, uh, which affected their life. Okay, Because the fact is, originally they just believed by faith. And then he would tell the church at Colossae, um, which that letter that he wrote to the church of Colossae later on. He said that as you have received Christ, so walk ye in him. And then we see later on at the end of this chapter that you know, he tells them to walk in the spirit. Um, for if they walk in the spirit, then, then they, you know, they're not going to fulfill the lust of the flesh. So he gives them the same answer, the same alternative. In other words, you uh, were saved by faith, and then the way you're supposed to live now as a, as a, as a born-again Christian is the same way that you got saved, which was is, is by faith. Okay, it's not, it's not by any kind of deeds or uh, anything like that, even though faith will work. <laughs> okay? Uh, and that's that's not a dichotomy or an argument. That's just simply, uh, or a contradiction, but rather, it's faith will work. Okay, if um, let me put it to you like this. Uh, the, evi the evidence well, yeah, the evidence that you would believe something would be the, the the, the behavior that would follow regarding uh, whatever whatever the command would be. In particular, as far as being born again, we don't work to get born again. In other words, we can't do anything to get born again, so how would you know somebody who's born again? Well, the person knows, and God knows, but the fact is, the person, if they've called on Jesus, the Bible says that uh, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Uh, that... Um, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thy heart that God has risen from the dead, thou shalt be saved. So you look at what do they believe about Jesus? Do they believe he's God? Literally, that's that's the clearest. If you believe in the deity of Christ, uh, Romans 10 just is very plain and simple in your face about the fact. You know, um, that's what evidence you would have. What do they believe about Jesus? Is he God Almighty? And then had they call on him? Because the thing is, you don't you can't do anything. And it's not now. As far as there's sanctification commands that are directed to Christians, as far as that you know, thou shalt or thou um, him that stole, let him steal no more, but rather uh, labor with his hands that thing which is good. So okay, so this guy, if he believes that, then he's going to be working hard and not um, he's not going to be stealing anymore, or you know, and then let let all bitterness and wrath and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you uh, with all malice. But be kind one one to another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. Somebody that believes that is going to be a tender hearted person. Uh, they're going to be a forgiving person. Uh, so you see the evidence of that carried out. But as far as with regard to the gospel, the way to believe that is they would have called on Jesus. And then they'd also, because of Christ's command that we're supposed to go into all the world and preach that gospel, they're going to be telling people, hey, you know, believe on Christ. Christ is the one that is your propitiation. He's the one that is going to be a satisfactory sacrifice. He's the one that uh, you get forgiveness of sin. You know, the Bible says that uh, neither, uh, neither is there salvation in any other, for there's none other that ain't under heaven given among men, among men whereby we must be saved. So, but, but he introduces here this subject, kind of in passing, is the fact that he's seeking to please God and not man. And if we seek to please men, then you're not going to be a servant of Christ. You're not going to be somebody that... Uh, it's going to be well-pleasing to God because your loyalty will be divided or your loyalty will be in the wrong place. Now go to uh, Ephesians. Go to Ephesians. Ch uh, chapter 6, Ephesians 6. These are kind of written around the same time when Paul was in, in, in house arrest. So he wrote to the church at Ephesus and then he wrote to the church at Colossae. Uh, the gentleman that he would have written or sent by hand to, with uh, not Onesimus, but uh, Epaphras, would have been somebody that would have been born again in Paul's ministry at Ephesus uh, when he, when he, when he uh, was there at the school of Tyrannus for about what, two, two and a half years. 
ministering, and then Epaphras took the gospel back to his hometown of Colossae, and then people were born again, and then he wrote to Colossae. And we're going to look at Colossians as well, because it's, they're, they're basically parallel. They're almost word for word when we read them. I'm, I'm more familiar with um, um, the Colossians passage. I keep wanting to quote that in my head, as opposed to this one. Uh, but they're almost word for word. Uh, but Ephesians, or excuse me, yeah, Ephesians 6, uh, beginning in verse 5, it says, Servants, okay, be obedient to them that are your masters according to the flesh, with fear and trembling, okay, in singleness of your heart as unto Christ, not with eye service as man pleasers, but as servants of Christ doing the will of God from the heart, okay, with good will doing service as to the Lord, uh, and not to men, knowing that whatsoever good thing any man doeth, the same shall he receive of the Lord, whether he be bond or free. Okay, now he, he's going to say, well, you know what? Uh, we'll continue because it, it kind of applies as well. It says, and ye masters do the same things unto them, forbearing, threatening, knowing that your master also is in heaven, neither is there any respect of persons with him. All right. Now, here, um, we introduce the subject because that in Galatians, he wasn't talking, if this is this is specifically just a work ethic command. It's going to be the same thing in Colossians, but we'll see it. He, he has a, it's slightly different worded, but it's almost verbatim. Um, but the concept is here as far as being a man pleaser, and that's kind of what I, what, uh, what I wanted to address. Um, now, Paul, when he preached the gospel, he preached it not as a man pleaser. Okay, so what he, he brought up the subject as far as the he preached and what he preached was because that's what for one it's truth, but he didn't have a respect of person uh, that would control him uh, from saying what God wanted him to say. Now in in, in this particular uh, portion, Paul had written to the church at Ephesus and he had um, up to up to this well, up to about chapter 4, he had been dealing primarily with just doctrine as far as the church. And then he starts addressing as far as how the church is to live, uh, as far as, the, obviously, the individual members. And then he starts addressing particular relationships within uh, the church. So you have as far as husbands and wives, which we saw, in, in, and, then, and then he addresses as far as children. Uh, and then he addresses the parents as well, that they're supposed to raise up their, uh, their children in the nurture and admiration of the Lord. Uh, and then he deals here with servants and then also the masters. So we don't really have that necessarily in our in American society, but the closest would be, I guess, is with, uh, an employer-employee type uh, relationship. So the ones that would be the servants would be the ones that would be under authority from somebody that is a boss, okay, as an employer or you know business owner of some sort. And so they're supposed to, they told them, be obedient to them that are your masters according to the flesh, with fear and trembling, and signals of your heart as unto Christ. And then they're not to do so with eye service. So his command is you be submissive as a, as a servant, okay, as an employee. And it says, with fear and trembling and signals of your heart. So in other words, you have a focus, you have a single focus, you have a determination and a purpose, and beyond that, that it's supposed to be uh, excluding eye service, eye service. All right, it's kind of an interesting word, eye service. Well, what that is is, uh, I'm sure. Well, okay, maybe not. Maybe 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 some of you don't have it, but like, there. Um, Y'all ever been in an environment, as far as those of you that have worked in the work field, where you have, say, maybe a group two, three, four, or maybe more than that, and then you have a manager delegates a responsibility to the group, and then you have, once he's out of the area physically, that everybody just kind of like slacks off or takes their time and not is applied or diligent as they probably could be or should be in being able to finish a task. So in other words, they, they do it with, well, he's not around, so. Uh, you know, I can kind of do whatever I want, so we just don't really approach it as something as really of high priority or importance. Okay, that would be kind of roughly less examples uh, as far as what I've personally experienced. Um, 
not just, well, I saw it a lot in the military, <laughs> but it's not exclusive to the military, but just any work environment that you would have. Um, eye service would be basically, they're hovering over you, they're looking at you, and so you do things just to kind of get them off your back rather than have uh, a passion or uh, a heart that says, listen, I need to do a good job and it needs to get done and that's about the job. It's about be, uh, accomplishing the task or the goal at hand and not being governed or controlled by the, a person's presence. Okay, if I work differently, um, and here's what I mean by that. Okay, if I am less diligent or prioritize in, in, in my responsibility um, because of a person's presence or lack thereof, then I'm in, a, in effect, I'm, I'm doing it as a as I service as unto a man rather than uh, as unto the Lord. Okay, we're supposed to be governed by conscience. He says here, we're in contrast, uh, we're supposed to do it with singleness of your heart as unto Christ, and then but as servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart. Okay, he, this is a big emphasis. And it says, with good will, doing service as to the Lord and not to men. So that's like three times in about three verses back to back. This concept that I work for God. Okay, um, well, in my case, my company, my security company, writes me a check. So when I get my check, okay, yeah. But the thing is, it's, that's from God. Okay, I'm, I have multiple supervisors uh, where I work. That I'm responsible to obviously to to um, to basically address with regard to whatever this de delegated responsibility they give up to me. But the fact is, it's unto the Lord. It's unto God. God is my boss. God is the one that is controlling me. God is the one that not just me, but all of us. And so um, he says we're supposed to do it as from the heart, uh, singleness of heart, and that. They're supposed to, well, in Romans he says that we're supposed to be fervent, fervent, fervent in the spirit, fervent in, in our business. So there's a passion, there's a fire there for it. And here's why, it's because it says up to the Lord. Um, and then he says, verse 8, um, Knowing that whatsoever good thing any man doeth, the same shall he receive of the Lord, whether he be bond or free. Okay, so now your present status, in their case, He's speaking to slaves, okay? They don't really have a choice about the fact that they have the responsibilities that they have to do and the tasks that they have to do. Um, you know, it could be life or death situation for them. Um, in our case, you know, we're freemen. Um, we're willingly uh, oblige ourselves and sell ourselves, uh, bind ourselves to a contract to whatever company or whatever employment agency, whatever that we are working under to go ahead and receive the paycheck and to receive the pay that we have um, based, you know, based on our exchange of time and life for work. Um, but these men were, in many cases, just slaves. But God says that um, he will reward uh, knowing that whatsoever good thing any man doeth, the same shall he receive of the Lord. God rewards our labor. Okay, that's a promise. You could take that to the bank. Okay, God rewards, and not just here, mind you. This is going to our account of either wood, hay, stubble, gold, silver, precious stone. So I'm supposed to be governed. Now he addresses the masters as well, that the masters are not to be abusive. They're not supposed to be of ill manner towards their, his employers or his employees. Um, he says, forbearing, threatening, uh, knowing that your master also is in heaven. So and they're. There's, neither is there respect of persons with him. So in other words, God doesn't care if you are, as an employer, you know, have whatever kind of weight, money, or, or power to kind of throw around. The fact is, if you're doing wrong, you're going to receive wrong. Okay, you're going to be judged. God's got judgment coming for you. You do right, then you got blessing, you got reward. Uh, and that's a promise from God. Now here's the thing. Motivating factors. Motivating factors. Uh, we're going to turn to Colossians, um, but motivating factors. One, I know God rewards, so there's reward, God will bless, but two, 
God knows and sees. All right? I'm supposed to be doing it on the basis of conscience. Apostle Paul wrote that uh, he exercised himself to maintain a clear conscience uh, before God and before man. Uh, that is something that he had as high priority as something that was very important and paramount in his life so that when he would stand before God, he would not have wood hay stubble or he would not have something that would be displeasing or have to stand before him ashamed, uh, but rather uh, he could be clear and free and be able to go ahead and worship God freely, be used of God, be blessed. Um, so having having clear conscience, go to Colossians chapter 4. Well, actually, chapter 3. Colossians 3. It'll be the end of the chapter. Colossians 3. Okay, verse 22. It says, servants, obey in all things your masters according to the flesh, not with eye service as men pleasers, but in signals of heart, fearing God. And then whatsoever you do, do it heartily, as to the Lord and not unto men, knowing that of the Lord ye shall receive the reward of the inheritance, for ye serve the Lord Christ. Okay, but he that doeth wrong shall receive for the wrong which he hath done, and there is no respect of persons. And it's, all, it's almost word for word. It's like he condensed it a little bit, but it's almost word for word. We just wrote to the church at Ephesus. Um, and then he, again, if you want to start in verse 4, Masters, give unto your servants that which is equal, and which is just and equal, knowing that you also have a master in heaven. And so um, they're not to do wrong by their employees, and then the servants are supposed to serve. But mind you, yeah, they're serving whoever it is that their master, they're serving their employer, but the fact is, in reality, they have, or they should have the awareness of the mindset Reckon it the fact that I'm serving God. In other words, this is, it, it seems kind of silly. Um, you know, I, I worked food service for seven and a half years, okay, five of which was at a fast food restaurant. <laughs> not, very, not making very much money, <laughs> okay. Those were really lean times in my life, but I worked as a grill cook and, uh, in a not very nice part of town. And I received a lot of abuse, not just from you know, people that I worked with, but not, you know, well, not so much. I mean, I, some from the people I worked with, but not, not so much from them, but as much as from uh, the customers that were there. Um, and it's like, man, am I, what in the world is going on here? Uh, it's, you know, I need to pay bills, so I'm coming to work. And it's like, there's not really much good work that I could have found that wouldn't have conflicted as far as at the time I was going to college uh, to be able to facilitate me being able to go and, and, and have the schedule that I had for my classes uh, and still be able to pay my bills. But um, anyways, while I, was, while I was there, I just remember thinking a lot of times, this is miserable and you want to just lash out and just be terrible and you, you just, you know, a lot of times you want to just take it out in your flesh on the fact, man, I don't need this, I don't need this dumpy job, I don't need this, you know, you can go and well, <laughs> like the, the where the song says, you know, but just uh, the fact was, it's like, wait a minute, this is from God, you know, this is how God, God's the one that gives you the strength to be able to go ahead and, you know, gain wealth, and then this was my assigned uh, place of duty, uh, my duty station, if you will, from him to be able to not only, you know, feed myself and be able to get, you know, the finances that I needed to be able to uh, fulfill my responsibilities, uh, not just with school, but just in life in general, but also to be able to go ahead and minister. The fact is he wants to use you to draw people to him. Uh, and a lot of times when we sit here and we complain, uh, which he addresses in Philippians a lot as far as that we're supposed to do all things without murmurs and disputings, uh, we present a marred image of who he is. Uh, and a lot of times even with the provision that we do receive, it might be meager. The fact is we can proclaim as in Hebrews 13, that the Lord is my helper, I shall not fear what man shall do unto me. So in other words, God helps me, and he uses that uh, to be able to, to, to be a testimony. Uh, but the fact is, it's real easy to want to get an attitude and want to uh, have a mentality that says, look, you know, um, I deserve better. Maybe, maybe you do, maybe you do, but the fact is, you're serving God, and 
if we're serving God, I mean, really, doesn't he deserve the best? I mean, he gave the best for us. And mind you, it's not just for, for you know, us to experience. Yeah, he came to give life and life more abundantly, but the fact is we have eternal life and we have, uh, as the Bible puts it, great, you know, um, not just great and precious promises, but we have an inheritance in corruptible and undefiled that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for us, and a great number of other things that you know, we can't even begin to kind of like scratch the surface of, of incredible blessing that we have. You know, the creator of the universe wants us to be able to spend time with him, uh, seeks for us to spend time with him, uh, and we serve him. Okay, we're, that's a privilege, honestly. <laughs> Seriously. Um, okay, how many of y'all have beyond a secret clearance, or even a secret clearance? A secret clearance. Secret? Yeah, secret clearance. Military? Or even the ability to be able to garner one. Or to be able to get one. Garner one. I don't have one. I took that I lost mine when I got out. I did have it because of some of the stuff that we worked on, but beyond that, um, you know, they go through a pretty extensive process just to even uh, like get in a security detail that deals. Um, well, okay, I had a few. I had a few friends that went to HMX. It's a helicopter detail or the helicopter squadron um, for the president. <coughs> Oh yeah, cool. Um, they had FBI. Uh, well, they didn't really have NSA at the time, but they had it was primarily as FBI. But and then they had other government agencies that went like a thorough background check, where they went through basically any family member that they could have gotten a hold of. They went and interviewed people as far back as like your third grade elementary <laughs> school teachers and stuff like that. Any and everybody that you could have thought of that would have any kind of affiliation or knowledge of this person, uh, and they like thoroughly interrogated them to see if there's anything that would be disqualifying or that anything that would uh, be um, a cause for alarm as to whether or not we can take this person in for that particular detail. Uh, that's commonplace for anything that would be of, of high clearance, of high, of high security clearance. Um, so, you know, okay, it might not be as hard, so, it, 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 um, I don't know, I never, <laughs> I never, I never volunteered for any of that, uh, and I, I was never selected, not that I really would have wanted to, but anyways, the fact is, we go through all these stringent, uh, things for stuff like that, but here, as born-again Christians, okay, we serve God Almighty, the King of Kings, the creator of the whole universe, right? Uh, he holds it, not just in his hand, as the song says, but he's able to, he's sustaining it right now uh, by the word of his power. And we're in service to him. When we seek to do less than what our best is, now mind you, you're not me, I'm not you, and we're different, okay? So in other words, uh, it's wrong, and it's, it's not really wise for me to go ahead and sit there and determine or judge as far as, like, you know, we're, uh, we're not supposed to compare ourselves among ourselves, but there is something as, and this will be primarily on the conscience level, as what is standard and what is best what is high quality, and you want to give not just your best, but of your best to the Lord in your service, in fervency, and uh, do so on the basis of the fact that, one, he's God, okay, he rewards, and then we have the knowledge that he's there, he's in us, okay, he's with us. It's not just, okay, yeah, he's in heaven, where on earth the fact is we have the Holy Spirit that um, by whom we're sealed until the day of redemption he lives inside of us when we say things or we watch things or we hear things that we shouldn't 
is right there with us. Okay? And so the fact is when we behave in that manner, uh, as far as seeking to please a man or please a man, we're going to be displeasing to him and we'll receive reward for that as well. Right? And what I mean by that is, he says, the way he puts it here is, he that doeth wrong shall receive for the wrong which he hath done, and there's no respect of persons. All right? Uh, so, <laughs> you're going to reap what you sow with regard to that. Okay, you do wrong, you get wrong. Uh, you're not going to be blessed. And God doesn't respect the person. It doesn't matter who you are, uh, how long you've been born again, what kind of authority you might have here on earth. The fact is, he's got. Um, so now, oh, but in Proverbs 29, 25, the Bible tells us that the fear of man bringeth a snare. Okay, fear of man bringeth a snare. But whoso putteth his trust in the Lord shall be safe. Whoso putteth his trust in the Lord shall be safe. Okay. Fearing man or seeking to please man is going to displease Christ. Fearing man and seeking to please man uh, is going to rob us of reward. Fearing man and seeking to please man will bring us judgment, basically. So how do we avoid being man-pleasers? And how do I go about being a God-pleaser? Okay? One... Trust in the Lord. It says here in Proverbs 25 or 29:25, is that uh, whoso put his trust in the Lord shall be safe. Okay. Um, God's ways and God's pattern for how I'm supposed to behave and how I'm supposed to think uh, it should be what's governing me. And when I, I I look at it like this. Okay. It's like you get backed in a corner and you're being asked to uh, place a loyalty on someone or something, okay? And the fact is, as much as we might love uh, family, and I'm not trying to attack family, as much as we might love, you know, maybe a certain loved one, a friend, or our employer, or whoever the, the human might be, the fact is, if they're going contrary, or they're, they're gonna put me in a position that is contrary to what is clearly stated in the Word of God, then they don't deserve my loyalty. And here's what I mean by that, is that I'm, I'm to be loyal to Christ and His commands. And so, if, if you're going to put me in a corner, then I choose, I have to choose Christ. If you're going to remain more pleasing or being right, or remain right with Him. Um, so how do you seek to please man? Or how, excuse, how do you please man? How do you seek to please God? How do you seek to be not a man pleaser, but a God pleaser? Okay, trust in God, God's ways. Two, uh, he says, knowing that you shall receive of the reward of the inheritance, for you serve the Lord Christ. Okay, so in other words, we should have something that we know, and that is this. We're to reckon God rewards. Reckon the truth that God rewards. All right? Reckon the truth that God rewards. Uh, he says it very clearly. Uh, not just here, but in... in uh, what he said in Ephesians is that um, knowing that whatsoever good thing any man doeth, the same shall he receive of the Lord, whether he be bond or free. Okay, so God's not a respecter of person wherever you're at. Uh, reckon that God rewards. And then three, uh, you're supposed to do it heartily as unto the Lord and not unto men. Uh, the fact is, reckon God's presence. Reckon God's presence. This is something I believe that uh, I know certainly I need to practice a lot more of, uh, but a lot of Christians really don't practice enough uh, is the reality that God is with us. Okay, The fact, not just, okay, yeah, you saved me, you know, I have a spirit, but the reality of the fact that he's with me. He's, he's with me now. And it's not just because we're in church, but the fact is when I go home, wherever I might live, well, I live down in Lauder Hill, my, my condo, but, you know, if we were uh, in a college dorm room, if you're in a barracks, uh, even if you're homeless, the fact is, if you're born again Christian, God is with you. Not the fact, okay, he said, yeah, I'll never leave you or forsake you. 
you may not feel his presence, but the reality is he's in you. Okay? Uh, we have the Spirit of Christ. We're sealed with the Spirit of Christ, and he's, he's with you, he's in you. So we need to reckon God's presence. It would keep us from a lot of the things that we walk into as far as sin is concerned, and that we choose that keeps God's Spirit quenched and grieved to the point where, um, you know, a lot of times we go about our business and we go about our life um, without really having that sensitivity. We want to cultivate that sensitivity to God's leading, God's spirit in our life because he's got a lot that he wants to do in and through us and he's got a lot that he wants to do in being able to reach this world. Uh, and he's, he's basically using us. He wants to use us. He's, that's, that's the vehicle that he's chosen to be able to go and do. Yeah, we, it's through his word, obviously, but it's, it's through believers. And so when we quench or grieve, which in part is because of the not reckoning, and then because of that, in turn, we a lot of times will choose sin, which keep him quenched, grieved, then we lose out and we miss out on those opportunities. But if we reckon his presence, uh, keep in mind that reality, that awareness, have in mind, then it makes it that much more easier to where I can be aware when sin is trying to tempt me, uh, being from the world or from my flesh, I can fight it, reckon the other truths as far as that, yes, I am dead indeed to, uh, to sin, but I'm alive unto Christ, and then I can avoid that, and then take, and take advantage of the opportunities that it affords me. All right, so, if I should seek to please men, then I should not be a servant of Christ. So, let's seek not to please men, but let's seek to please the Lord. All right? Knowing that of the Lord ye shall receive the reward of the inheritance, for ye serve the Lord Christ. All right? God will reward. God promises to reward. Let's reckon his presence. Let's reckon the reality of the fact that he rewards. And let's practice it. And let's trust God and fear him uh, rather than man. Because the fact is, man can't really do anything unto me. Yeah, he can take my life. But the fact is, it's only if God allows that. And God's greater than a man. You know, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. I know in context that's speaking of Satan, but the fact is he's greater than any human. And uh, God could, you know, make bad situations to be abundant and blessing. Uh, if we would allow him, if we would trust him, we would let him. All right, so let's pray. Father, thank you for this evening. Lord, I pray that we would uh, seek to be men, or excuse me, we would seek to be uh, pleasers of you rather than pleasers of men. Uh, Lord, that we would not uh, be fearful of man, and Lord, that uh, we'd be able to see a lot accomplished uh, in being able to not just reach uh, Oakland Park and Broward County, but Lord, uh, the world for you uh, in these coming days. I pray now that you uh, help us to get home safe this week, or tonight. And, uh, Lord, uh, that we have many uh, good divine appointments this week. Uh, and, Lord, you'll be able to lead some souls to you uh, with the divine appointments. Uh, thank you for what you do. I praise in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Dismissed.